Hello. Hi, I'm Alice. Um, can you hear me all right? I think so, yes. Uh, so I'm the CEO of a little company called Makey Lab, and we make 3D printed toys from game technology. And if you want to go and have a look at uh, much of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, the Makeys, which are our dolls, are just on the first floor of the mezzanine. Jen, do you know which actual bit it is labeled? DC, can't remember. Just above the main room on the, on the little balcony. So this is um, me and my other half, Corey, who's the person who's coming in next, and you've just been warned by because he tends to pack places out. He's a science fiction writer, and, and uh, my whole background is in kind of tech innovation. Uh, previously, I was at Channel 4 making uh, educational games for kids and stuff like that. And so we kind of hang around things like this. We've been going to make affairs for ages and what was then called Fab Labs and uh, getting things like scanned. So this is when we went to visit MakerBot a couple of years ago and they stuck flour on us and hand scanned us. And then now you can download the pair of us from Thingy Thingiverse and 3D print us if you want to. Uh, somebody did that to Corey and stuck him on a dolphin. So um, the way Makey's came around, this really resonates for me, the do try this at home thing, because we pretty much made it up as we go along, um, not least because nobody had done 3D printed toys before, so we had to just discover how to do it ourselves using a combination of science fiction, the internet, and, you know, et cetera, hard work. Um, and what happened for me was a couple of years ago, around 2009, I guess, Corey wrote a book called Makers, which is actually just set in the near future anyway, and it's about hackers and um, hacker space folks making, squishing stuff together to make cool new businesses, one of which was uh, toys. They hack um, Elmo's. And this book, The Real Toy Story, which was given to me by a friend, and he said, I think you're gonna like this. And it's a three decade history of what happened to the British and European and American toy industries, which are now um, pretty much universally uh, moved to the Far East for the manufacturing side of things. And then in the business side of things, they've kind of m and would merged with each other to become these huge corporations, the likes of Mattel or, or Disney and kind of not really much else. One of the first things that happens when Corey wrote his book, that was the front cover, I think, in the UK, but within weeks, this turned up through the post and it was a 3D printed version of the cover and somebody had hand reproduced the 3D model and then printed it and stuck it in the post and sent it through. And I immediately wanted to pop the things out, start assembling the toy, but I was not allowed to. And so this is now hanging on Corey's wall. And it was this amazing um, immediacy of here's a thing and then it has become real. It has be been made real, uh, which is pretty much only possible because of the recent advances in technology, including 3D printing. Previous to that, making toys or objects was pretty much an artisanal thing and or just very, very hard and expensive. At the same time, in 2009, I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft. That's me at the front. Jen is there, who works with us, and I think... Where are you, Jen? Is this you? I think that's you. This is what we used to do is um, muck around in World of Warcraft. And this is one of the times when, as a guild, we had an in-game dinner and then we went skinny dipping, as you do. But at the same time, a company called Figureprints started. And what Figureprints does is it will print, uh, 3D print your World of Warcraft game character for you for $150. And this little dude turns up under a bell jar and you now have a souvenir of the six months, literal actual six months that you spend in World of Warcraft. I played it for four years, but when you look at the amount of time that I was actually in it, it's something like six months. And I wanted one of these so badly as a souvenir of like my time in that place. Um, these aren't toys. The technology here is 3D printing. It's on a machine called Z Corp. It's the, the, the only ones at the moment where you can print full color, but it's super fragile. It's the equivalent of kind of concrete powder gypsum, actually, and then you soak it in super glue, so it makes a good statue and a terrible toy. The other thing that's happening, and I sort of feel like I'm preaching to the converted here, but um, in the past couple of years, this idea of manufacturing as a service has emerged, where companies like Pinoco or Shapeways have popped up, 
And we get asked a lot, you know, uh, is everyone going to have a 3D printer on their desktop, you know, next year? And the short answer is no, not really. I mean, we will, but for the most part, folks won't. Um, they're messy, they're difficult, they break down, they're smelly. But Shapeways and similar is kind of the equivalent of um, Kinko's or some kind of corner print shop where anybody can upload a file and then have it sent through the post back to them. Uh, who hasn't always wanted a three-legged Lego minifig, for instance. Um, Panoka does 3D printing and laser cutting, and this kind of stuff has emerged in these past couple of years. This is the Fab Cafe in Tokyo, where uh, they have the laser cutter, and I think the 3D printer is just right in the middle of the store, and you go in and you get your latte, and you could just sit there and laser cut some cloth or whatever that your hobby is, is and, and take it home when you finished. And I think this is the sort of thing that's going to proliferate over the next couple of years. We're going to see a lot of this kind of space that you can drop into, do things, and leave uh, happen. So to go back to toys, the way toys are made, um, it's pretty much laid out in that book, but you find this stuff out as well as you're doing the research. Toys are mass manufactured. So they are designed, one object is designed, and then the idea is that you just replicate that and you push it through the system of lots and lots of shops. And we started with dolls, um, particularly because of the whole avatar to shape idea, to doll character idea, but also actually when you look at toys, dolls is the biggest single category. So we thought, well, that makes business sense. As it happens, our software is just, it's a 3D shape that is then made into a 3D shape. So a doll is a robot, is a, is a dinosaur. But we started with dolls, and dolls are extra interesting for toys. Somebody turned around from the toy industry about a year into our doing this and said, well, you do realize dolls are the hardest toy to make, don't you? And we were like, yeah, we do now, thank you. Um, but they illustrate how hard it is in the real world to do stuff traditionally. So this is um, the doll floor at a another toy uh, shop, usually called the girl's floor. It's always pink. Um, do toys are quite, uh, well, they're extremely expensive to make. So what happens is people want to reduce the risk as much as they can, which is why you just see a lot of stuff that looks exactly the same. So to give you a doll example, when you're using injection molding, you make a mold for each piece. So if your arm is made of two pieces or three pieces, including the hand, that's three molds. And the molds start at $10,000, and a good one is $100,000. So you can do the math. You've got 18 pieces or whatever in a body. It's extremely expensive to make the basic molds to make the doll. After that, you've got the minimum order quantity, which a factory is going to want. So you have to guarantee a run of, let's say, 5,000. That's quite low, but let's say 5,000. At which point, they assemble it. Uh, you pay to have it shipped out of China or Vietnam or wherever it is being made and through to the country where you're going to be selling it, so the biggest path here is to the States, at which point you warehouse it, again, another cost, and then you do the deal with the toy company for the most part. So I was at the, at the toy fair and overheard a brilliant pitch between an inventor and Toys R Us, and the inventor had a book, and he had a little toy stuck to the front of the book, and he wanted to get this made. And the Toys R Us person explained this whole process and said, we buy the idea from you when you have 150,000 of these units in the warehouse in the States. We won't consider it before that point. And this guy was like, I can't afford to do that. And the Toys R Us person was like, meh, sorry. This is why you see much of the same thing, because after this great expense, even by a big company, they don't want to risk it. So dolls look like... Dolls look like dolls. I mean, they all kind of look the same. If you look out in the real world, there's a lot of um, need, I think, and desire out there for personalized stuff, stuff that I have made or looks like me or my friends or my family. Um, I have a daughter. She plays with dolls and she makes little character stories. And she wanted a boy doll because she had lots of girl ones kicking around. Here's Posy doll, here's Mommy doll, where's Daddy doll? And I had to go back to Hamley's. I was like, I have a boy doll. And uh, they were like, yeah, boy dolls. Mm, we don't do Ken. I'm like, yeah, I don't want Ken. He's weird. Um, they said, well, we don't do Action Man. I said, where's Action Man? They said, we don't do Action Man. He's gone. We've replaced him with HM Forces. So you can have a doll with a red beret and a gun. Like, no, I don't want that. And moustaches. I don't want that. What else have you got? And they said, they thought for a while. And they went, we've got Thor in the WWF. I was like, no. And they said, well, we've got Justin Bieber. 
No. Okay, forget it. Um, this is American Girl. It's a doll owned by Mattel now. It's only in the States. It's a 450 million a year business for them. And they try to get around the personalization idea by brute forcing it. So what they do is you go into the shop and there's 40 dolls to choose from. 40 times that 100 grand per mold per piece system for them. So if you go in and you want a doll with brown hair and curly brown hair, curly brown hair and brown eyes, you've basically got about three to choose from. They're um, $109 up, and by the time you've come out, you've probably spent more like 400 So the second book called Makers turns up, and this one has really hit, I think. Um, when Corey was writing about Makers, everyone was like, well, like I said, it was sort of fab labs, and now there's you know, maker spaces and hacker spaces, and this stuff is hitting the mainstream. And with 3D printing in particular, this is the Gartner hype cycle. It's a chart that, that Gartner Research um, produces every year, and the shape never changes. What they do is they just plot stuff along the shape according to where they think it is. The shape is always the same. Here's something new. Here's everybody going, oh my god, it's amazing, it's going to change the world. Here's everybody going, oh, but I can't 3D print my own kidneys on my MakerBot. God damn it. Here's the, actually, this is amazing, and you can do X, Y, and Z, and we're practicing it. And this is where it hits the mainstream, or is considered to be mainstream. 3D printing is right up there right now. There is going to be a bit of a trough, as people discover that you don't just press a button and your trainers come out of it. Nevertheless, it deserves to be the um, largely hyped thing it is, because it, it, it does change everything. This is Professor Boya. He um, invented the RepRap here at the University of Bath, and pretty much did it in his kitchen. Um, he put this open source, stuck it on the internet. The rep wrap is the replicating 3D printer, self-replicating. So all of the plastic parts in it, the metal parts are standard um, chemistry stuff, and the plastic parts are all printed by itself. So the first one printed the second one, the second one printed the third one, and on it goes. This kicked off MakerBot. Um, and between this kind of stuff, a rep wrap, I think, starts at about 600 quid or 300 quid now. Six, so let's say 600 quid. This is a $40, as you know, programming board. I'm sure you've seen them all over the place out there. This stuff, put it in the hands of makers, and makers will make. So the other great thing about all of this that's happening right now and why it um, deserves to be hyped is because, again, it changes everything. For the first time, we're seeing people out there getting their hands into this kind of stuff who aren't just rich blokes, for instance. There's a lot of women involved. There's a lot of kids involved. There's a lot of older folks involved. These are the guys from Bear Paint. They're outside on the first desk as you come in, I think, as you see them. Uh, Lady Ada from Adafruit. She makes component bits and pieces. There we go. Jane from Sugru. That's the rubber that you can just mold into a shape and it self-hardens and you can use it for all sorts of stuff. And they're in B&Q now. Alex here made the good night lamp, and this kid programmed her own board. And that's just fabulous for me. That means anyone can have a go, and by having a go, you can create all sorts of good stuff. These are the ladies at Tatty Divine who make fantastic laser cut jewelry, just beautiful. And they have the laser cutter right there in the store, right at the front. So you go in and you look at the jewelry, and they're like, do you want your name on a necklace? Because we'll just do it right here manufacturing in the hands of makers. This is the machine that we use. It's an industrial 3D printer. It's German, and uh, it starts at about 125,000 euros for the little one. This is considered the little one. Um, the big ones are like half a million. Uh, just quickly, these machines five years ago, six years ago, were about 70 grand. What MakerBot produces now is about 70 grand, and now it's two. This thing is 125, as I said, but we're expecting it to come down radically in the next couple of years as a couple of patents expire. This is powder-based. So when you go and see the Makeys, you'll see they're very, if you see them, they're very um, fine. It feels like sort of smooth porcelain because it is effectively like powdered china, if you like, just, just lasered together. So going back to personalization, we set out to make personalized dolls. Um, dolls with a unique face, you build the face using sliders, but you also get to choose the hands, the feet, the clothes, the hair, etc. There's boys and girls. 
and uh, we get makers to make the clothes. So we make our own in-house and then we put the patterns on our forum and we encourage people to make their own and share them. And we've got folks on the forums making wigs for each other and selling stuff to each other. This is what happens when you see um, doll clothes on Etsy. It's completely different to Barbie clothes. It's interesting and personal. This is what happens when doll modders and um, hackers get their hands on a Blythe, for instance. Just turns out like this. This one has its lower lip shaved away because its owner, her owner, wanted um, what she called the overbite mod because it's cuter. And they really go to town with this stuff. We wanted to encourage that. So this is Makey's. It's a slider-based thing, and we went live in Open Alpha. Again, this is this is unusual. And you wouldn't see a toy, com normal toy company doing this, but we wanted folks to have a go, have a go themselves, tell us what works, tell us what doesn't work. So when it was live um, last May, when we first went live, bone white only, 99 pounds, uh, not toy safe at this point, but it gave us an idea of like what people would look for. So one of the first things we found out, for instance, was that, and it has stayed steady, 30% of our customers are male. Unusual for a, do a doll, I think, or you would think so, you'd assume it was all female. This is what it looks like inside the P100. That's how messy it is. So we're not going to be seeing this in a kind of Build-A-Bear workshop anytime soon, but maybe in five years when it's all more controlled. It needs to look clean by the time it goes to a customer. So we do a lot of hands-on stuff. This is in the workshop in London. The doll parts come back to us. They're assembled, cleaned, and the wig and the eyes and everything customized to each individual person. And it goes out like that. Um, I think a lot of people, when we're talking about this, think the whole 3D printing process just, again, it means it's very clean, enclosed. It's not. It's proper manufacturing. It's dirty. It's messy. Often painful. Makes us cry, but a lot of fun. So um, the first set went out, and some customers started customizing, which is great. I love the, f the way those two words are pretty similar. This is one of our um, ladies called Ducky Monster. I think she's a doctor. She has two, and this was, these are her dolls that she produced for Movember last year. Uh, this is a doll owned by Jaron, and he wanted a Lego Macabot for his, and so he built it and stuck the Lego onto the doll using Sugru. Uh, now, because the Lego patent has expired, we've got a little Lego backplate, which you can add on if you want to, which makes this little process a little bit easier. Sue is another user, and she did what's called a face-up. She painted the doll's face and then sent it back to us and said, this is, this is just one of the white ones, but if you paint it, this is what it looks like. And we were amazed by this because we weren't quite expecting it to look that good, frankly. We're like, oh my God, that really does look like a professionally made thing. So we cracked on with colors. Um, again, no, there are no, in no instructions yet. So we've stuck them up now, but there were no instructions that we could find on the internet about how to get that bone white powder into things like skin color. So we started boiling them in all sorts of stuff, onion skins, um, blueberries, PG Tips produces Caucasian, as it turns out. So <laughs> these guys were PG Tips. You can't quite see in here. This one's onion. Um, wasn't going dark enough for a decent spectrum, so we ended up using Dylon, just standard industrial Dylon. Works a treat. This is one of our users, um, a guy, Alan, in Scotland. He, he's got a couple of dolls that he uses because he's a science fiction writer. And he said... Here's mine, and I've uh, given it flocking, a little beard and hair using flocking. Do you know how to do flocking? And we said, no. So he's going to teach us. This is a little um, selection of how we're getting on with it now. We've got four colors at the moment, and we're continuing to boil little body parts to try for more. Um, but also the forumers are doing it themselves. They're posting under a really popular thread called We're Doing Science and posting the data there. The next one for us to figure out is how to do makeup in an automated way, which when you think about it, if every single face is different, how are we going to do that? So that's probably some form of automation. This gets solved in a couple of years when you can just 3D print in color in this kind of toy safe plastic. But for now, we're having to innovate. Um, the original ones are 10 inches high and have quite a big head. Somebody said, why is the head so big? Apart from the fact that all the interesting stuff happens in a face, um, the other thing is, is it's sized to fit a lily pad Arduino. So if you did want to give your doll a brain and muck around with that, you can. And one of our users, Kat, um, did exactly that and then stuck some Nekamimi ears on hers, which are expressive Japanese cat ears. 
Uh, so now, you see, she built them here in felt and straws with a little micro Arduino and some servos in there. And when you clap your hands, her doll's ears turn towards the sound, which is great. Um, for our future, we just launched uh, Makey's Doll Factory on the iPad, so now you can do it on the web, or do it on an iPad with a finger. So the users have got much younger now. It goes down. We're toy safety certified to three, and we're seeing that it starts at around kind of five. But this is also where the vision, if you like, comes full circle, because the game that's going to be coming out of this app that leads onto a game in July, um, customers will be able to, or players will be able to create patterns on clothes as well. And so not only will you be able to make the toy, you can doodle on clothes and then we can laser print the cloth and send it as a cloth kit from the patterns that have been created so you can make clothes for your doll and print out the furniture. So this, all of this happens here just because of things like laser cutters and 3D printers. That's a little indication of what we're doing next. No hair, no eyes, no clothes, but a 3D customizable object. Um, that happens to look like a uh, fighting warrior of some description. You can have a go if you haven't already. I'm sure you have. Um, this is 123D Sculpt. It's a free app on iPad made by the guys who make Autodesk, which is the professional software makers behind what we do. When you get good at it, you can make some pretty cool stuff. You can also use Minecraft. There's the Printcraft dudes just behind the egg here. So you can make stuff in Minecraft and send it straight to the printer, and it'll come out looking like this. And if you send it to Shapeways or similar, there's a bunch of other third parties where you can just export from your app, send it up, and then a week later you'll have an object that you've made yourself. And I really encourage you to, to do it if you haven't, because you can. And this is amazing. Finally, we can all have a go, and you don't have to be Mattel. So go for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? How long have I got? Did I go over? Couple of minutes and then Corey's up. So, any questions? Yeah. Do they break easy? No, no, not at all. They're solid nylon. So, they're actually very hard to break. They look like porcelain, but one of the toy safety tests. So, Makey's are the world's first 3D printed toy safe, blah, blah, blah. They passed the N71. One of the tests is they take the doll from very high. And, and just drop them, and that's called the shatter test. And it, and it bounces or breaks well, but we haven't managed to break them yet. Sorry? Yeah, there's about four or five of the dolls on the table up at the Makey's stand. So uh, in the main room where the lift is, if you just head up, they're just there, and you can go and have a play, and they've got a couple of iPads, so you can have a make as well. <laughs>